Good morning, everyone. We've got a lot of energy here. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing. Um, <coughs> hopefully you got enough sleep last night, but here we go. morning to you. Welcome to Gospel Hope. It's an honor to have all of you here with us this morning, especially those of you who are visiting for the first time. And uh, I think I see a few uh, of you who uh, are with us for the very first time today, and we welcome you. You've honored us by your choice to be with us today, and we are eager to get to know you better, find out ways that we might be able to serve you and encourage you, learn a little bit more about you. You could help us begin that process by taking one of the connection cards from the uh, seat pocket in front of you and uh, just give us a little information about who you are, where you're from, and then at the end of the service, we'll tell you what to do uh, with that card, and uh, we'll take it from there. But just an honor to have all of you here with us today. For those of you who are veterans here, you know that the second Sunday of the month typically is the Sunday we observe communion and share the Lord's table. And uh, we have that planned today. But unlike our, our typical service uh, where we make that the last thing we come to, uh, we're going to come to the Lord's table after just a couple of more songs. 
and uh, give you an opportunity to share in the bread and the cup uh, prior to the sermon. And uh, that may feel a little different for you, but I, I really wanted to give you a little heads up because I know that so many of you take the Lord's table uh, very seriously, which we all should, and you like to have the entire service to kind of get your, your mind and your heart in the right place. So it's going to come a little sooner this morning than it typically does, but you can still be prepared uh, in your heart and in your soul for the Lord's table. We're just so thankful uh, for all of you. And thank you for your participation and help as we've transitioned to two morning services. Uh, people continue to ask, how do you guys think it's going? And uh, have, have there been any significant difficulties? And there really haven't. I mean, we've had a few little bumps, uh, as you would expect, with something new like this. But you all have uh, been such a blessing as we've prepared for it. And now here we are week two. And even with a time change, it didn't seem to you know, really radically alter things in the first service. Although, I won't ask for confession, I'm sure some of you were very happy you had a later service option this morning, right? Um, and no reflection on your spirituality, of course. That, that's just, you know, sleep patterns and all of that. But we are really thankful uh, for what God is doing through this little transitional moment. So you continue to just love one another through it, be flexible, jump in and serve uh, what, a, what a great, great blessing it's been. Thanks to the men who stayed around after breakfast yesterday. It was quite remarkable to see that team clean, reset, prepare the building in about, the whole building in about 30 minutes uh, to get it ready for today. So men, I want to commend you for that. It's been just uh, a really great blessing. Well, we're going to continue singing here in just a moment. And as always, set your heart on the particular truths about who Jesus is and what he has done uh, to, to position you to come in full confidence and faith to the Lord's table. Uh, as we'll reflect on in just another few minutes when we come to the bread and the cup, it's not about your perfect performance over the past week that you're now somehow qualified or worthy uh, to take the bread and the cup. It's about the perfect work of Jesus Christ for you. And we want to sing of that and rejoice in it and uh, continue to worship the Lord together. Let's pray and ask for God's blessing over it all. Now, Lord, as we assemble in your name this morning, it's with great joy and thanks how grateful we are that you have accomplished everything necessary for our full salvation. And we pray that you would cause the, the truth of the gospel, the specific works that Jesus Christ did for us to be alive in our hearts today, that with full confidence that our sins are forgiven with full assurance that guilt and shame have been removed forever. We may worship you in song, in prayer, through the word, and through this precious table. And as we again join our voices and lift our hearts to you in praise, Spirit of God, would you empower us, strengthen us, that everything that flows out of us would be a direct result of your ministry within us. So come, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Bless us for your great namesake, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me here. <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I only
we've done before, um, but this is a slight little modification. We're adding a, a little chorus in there, but um, sing out, and uh, I'm sure you'll pick it up quickly. ask our deacons to come as they prepare to serve the bread and the cup. So thankful for the gift that this table is. It's a gift of our Lord uh, to reinforce the truths of the gospel. This bread is a beautiful and powerful symbol of his broken body. He submitted himself to that terrible breaking so that you and I could know that our sins are forgiven, that the gift of eternal life is ours, that we've been united to Jesus personally, eternally, irrevocably. And this cup is also a powerful symbol 
of the work of the gospel. He shed his blood, died a horrible death, and bled out, if you will, again, so that we might be forgiven. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of his blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. There's no other currency that you can transact with God to secure your forgiveness. And so on the one hand, we would you know, be thrilled to see this whole body serving and giving sacrificially and, and loving, but not even your work of service or a gift of sacrifice pays for your sins. Only the blood of Jesus. As we say pretty much every month, you don't have to be a member of Gospel Hope Church to participate here at the table today, but you do need to be someone who, by God's grace, is walking in faith, trusting in the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ for your forgiveness and for your hope of eternal life. We come to this table because we're not yet perfect. We come to this table because we are in continual need of God's cleansing and forgiveness. But again, these very precious elements uh, reinforce for us that all of that is found in Jesus. So we welcome all of you. Uh, the men are going to serve first the bread, and I should say, I've been forgetting to say this, there's a little glass cup in the middle of the dish that has prepackaged gluten-free portions of the bread. And we know that will be a blessing and help to some of you as you partake. But we're going to wait until all have been served. And while the men are serving, the worship team is going to continue to lead us in a couple of songs. And if you'd like to sing along, you're welcome. I know some of you like to actually pray quietly, meditate on God's word, just preparing your heart while the music is, is being played and sung in the background. And that's okay, too. Uh, so you'll have a few minutes here while the bread is being served. And then we'll take that together. And then we'll repeat that with the cup as well. So we're glad you're here to participate with us. And um, man, let's, uh, let's serve the bread. I'm going to ask Randy Davis to lead us in a prayer of thanks for the bread um, before we serve and take this together. And so you join your heart with him as we pray in thanks. God, our Father, we thank you for this covenant that you have given us, this promise of mercy and kindness, that you would send your Son to be broken for us, that we don't have to be perfect, but that in him and his work, it is finished and that we can be united with you. It's in Christ's name we pray.
I want to read a portion of Isaiah 53 as you meditate on what it means that Christ's body was broken for you. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we judged him to be stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. How precious this bread is to us because of all that it symbolizes, all that Christ has done. Do this with me in remembrance of our dear Savior. Andrew, please. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, we uh, come to you right now in this fellowship of believers, God, and we marvel at the magnitude of your son's sacrifice on our behalf, God. May we be in constant awe and reverence of the price that was paid on our behalf. God. May we put aside all worldly distractions and focus on you and the spilled blood on our behalf. See all these things in Jesus' name. There is a fountain.
continuing in Isaiah 53. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. That's you and me. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. And by the knowledge of him shall the righteous, shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be justified. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. As was mentioned just a moment ago in our prayer of gratitude, the work is finished. And yet Christ's work of interceding for us continues. Even while we're here at this table, he's praying for you. What great love this is. So as we take this cup, the symbol of his shed blood, the power of his forgiveness, let us do this in remembrance of our dear Savior. Would you open your Bibles to Luke 6? The Savior who prepared this table for us and calls us. Oh, and don't you love the line from that hymn, Beneath the Cross? Hands which should discard me hold wounds which tell me, come. That's a vivid picture. Powerful truth. Well, that same Jesus stands before us and says, come. Come hear me. Come to my word. And so we do in faith. Luke 6, we're going to begin reading this morning in verse 17. That's page 862, if you're using one of the Bibles uh, from the seat rack near you. And I hope all of you will uh, take a copy of the Scriptures and follow along as I read. Luke 6, verse 17. And he, Jesus, came down with them, his disciples, and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you. And when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man, rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so the fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. 
And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Let's pray together, please. Great God and King, we are exactly like this great crowd that assembled to hear and to be healed. We too are riddled with diseases that need your healing touch, troubled by unclean spirits that need to be cured. And we too are in desperate need of your power that we might be healed in mind and heart, in soul and spirit. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. We are also like this crowd in that we need to hear you. Will you please speak to us through this holy word? Will you wash us with the water of the word and sanctify us in your truth according to your promise? For your word is powerful truth. Your word is a lamp for our feet and a light for the path as we journey through life. And only in your light do we see light. Speak to us through this holy word. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. Your word tells us that no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. But you have been given to us as our instructor and teacher, as that personal comforter, the the one who indwells us so that we by faith may receive you, the Spirit who is from God, and that we may hear you speak to us in order that we may understand the things freely given to us by God. So come, Holy Spirit. Bless this time in the word according to your good and gracious and sovereign will. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our great Savior and the only begotten Son. It is in Jesus' name, amen. As you can see from the the title slide, uh, this is not a, an original or even that creative title for sermons. That's one of the things that, honestly, I, I tend to struggle with and kind of do it last. But this is referred to in several different commentaries as the Sermon on the Plain. And you may say, hey, wait a minute, I thought this is the Sermon on the Mount because it sounds very similar and some, some, uh, it's, some identical themes are carried through this. And you are right. If you were to compare this with Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you would see many similarities. But here's why it is called the Sermon on the Plain. If you go back to verse 17, when Jesus came off of the mountain, and remember he had had the all-night prayer time, which we didn't cover this last Sunday. I actually touched on it briefly Wednesday night at our praise and prayer time. But Jesus had selected 12 men out of a larger group of disciples, and Luke is describing that he came down with them and stood on a level place. There's your plane. It's a powerful sermon. A great crowd gathers around Jesus both to hear and to be healed. And as one author notes for us the, that Luke heralds the way of the kingdom of God as a radical antithesis to the ways of the world. Specifically, the way of the kingdom is one of solidarity with the poor and needy. Jesus didn't choose 12 disciples who had impressive personal resumes, who had graduated from elite schools, who had years of experience in the business world or leadership development or Rome's army or even Israel's Sanhedrin. No, the way of the kingdom is one of solidarity with those who are easily overlooked, the poor and needy. Not the pursuits and indulgences of the wealthy. The way of the kingdom resists conformity to the common denominator of the here and now. And the here and now is the mentality of our present culture as well as Jesus' day. 
This author goes on to say, but it allows life's here and now to be permeated by the eternal realities of the coming kingdom of God. And oh, how I pray that your heart would be pierced with this powerful truth today to know that your here and now matters, not in the way that the currents of culture and present world views might might sell you an idea that your life matters, but in the way that Christ's kingdom message here in Luke 6 pulls you into a totally different perspective and value system. Your here and now matters, and it has greater bearing than you and I can fathom on the then and there. And that's what many people fail to see. Now, in this sermon, there are three particular parts that we're going to look at today. And the first part is this. I want you to notice in verses 20 to 24 that Jesus promises blessing for those who follow him. But, it, but it's, all, it's not all, you know, roses and fairy dust. Jesus never proclaims a message of come to me and I'll make your life dreams come true. No, he's fully aware that to follow him means a temporary cost. As we read through this passage, were you impressed, as I am impressed, that there are terms that actually none of us really want to be characterized by? Poor, hungry, perpetual weeping. I mean, that sounds like a really needy soul. That sounds like a pitiable condition. Hated, excluded, reviled, spurned as evil. Well, these are the things that Jesus is fully aware are the temporary costs of following him. The the poverty that he speaks of here has to do with a destitution, and he he doesn't define it here in this sermon uh, as he does in the famous Sermon on the Mount. It, It is broader even than just poverty of spirit. It could include the loss of material resources, of wealth itself. Hungry? That has reference to those who really never have enough to eat. They really are famished, starving. Some of you skip breakfast, maybe even most days of the week, but particularly on a Sunday morning, and maybe you slept a little too long this morning. You said, you know what? It's only a couple of hours that'll be there, and we'll have lunch before long. But even now, as I'm talking about, I mean, you can feel your stomach turn a little bit and maybe rumble a little bit, and you hope the person next to you doesn't hear you know, those hunger pains talking to you right now. And we will even sometimes say after a period of, you know, going without one meal or maybe even two, I'm starving. But very few of us have actually ever been starving. But, you know, for some of the followers of Jesus, even in his time, it meant foregoing food security. And it may even mean that for our generation To weep, as Jesus notes here, has to do with just freely and profusely crying because there's perpetual sadness and distress in the soul. Nobody wants to live in existence like that, but Jesus knows to follow him may actually cost us these very kinds of things. To be hated is to have active ill will perhaps in words or conduct brought against you. To be excluded, we all know what that uh, entails. To be reviled, that has to do with someone finding fault in you and even, even expressing that fault or condemnation in a harsh and demeaning manner. And to be spurned is to be rejected. Now, did you notice this? All of that is tied into that little phrase at the end of of verse 22, on account of the Son of Man. That's the cost of following Jesus. And you may not experience all of these things, but I know for a fact some of you have already experienced a few of these things because following Jesus doesn't make sense often to family or friends. Some of you have felt the condemnation and exclusion, even being reviled because you've chosen what many deem to be an old-fashioned, out-of-date worldview and, and religious perspective. Jesus is fully aware of it. 
And even as he's sharing this, he's had some disciples who've recently chosen to leave everything else behind and follow them. What did it actually cost Peter and Andrew and James and John as they left the established fishing business to follow Jesus? What did it cost Matthew as he answered the call to follow Christ? Not only a lucrative tax collecting uh, appointment that he had enjoyed for a period of time, but even the protection of the Roman government. There was no one now to give him that necessary protection. And you know, this is some of you who have left family and friends and even a former way of life to follow Jesus. Some of you can tell stories of losing business contracts who have even struggled financially at least for a season because you chose to follow Jesus and others around you could not understand it and they began to reject you and cut themselves off from you. Some of you have wept profusely because of broken relationships as a result of following Jesus. Some of you have borne upon your heart the stinging accusations of those who vehemently oppose your choice to follow Jesus. Some of you can tell stories of being reviled or even mocked in the, in the family household or the workplace because you follow Jesus. Well, this is the cost of discipleship. But did you notice how woven into the recognition of this steep cost of discipleship are promises of eternal blessing? And that's what Jesus wants each of us to see. Four times he says, blessed are you. Well, who's doing the blessing? Well, clearly it's God. And he is saying, first of all, you're already favored by God right now at this moment. Despite all of that suffering, despite all the turmoil, despite the cost, you truly are blessed at this very moment. But woven into the present blessing is a promise of a kingdom, isn't it? Look at the text again. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom. It's present reality. We have to receive that by faith because, you know, some of you say, well, I'm not driving a kingdom car. I mean, it's a broken down beater. Shouldn't I have more? Well, we'll get there. I don't know what kind of transportation heaven holds, but, man, it's going to be perfect. I was talking to someone after the first service who had some car issues this week, and it's just a bit of a hassle, and you know, it's, not like, it's not like the end of the world, but some of you also could tell stories, and you, I mean, you want to believe Jesus, but stuff keeps breaking down, and you wonder, like, I... Is it real? Yes, it is. Look at the next statement. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. So there's a, there's a future moment coming where e- even the hunger that you experience will be no more, but it's not just that you have enough to eat. You're actually going to be full. That's, what is, that, that's what's woven into the word satisfied. Imagine uh, one day of existence where if somebody came to you and said, what do you need? And you actually said, in truth, in full honesty, like, I'm in need of nothing. I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm not in need of more food. I'm not in need of more clothing. I'm not in need of more love or more affirmation. But you look across the full spectrum of your life and say, I'm satisfied. Now, that's not today. That is a future point, but Jesus is promising it. Look at the next blessing. Those of you who weep, now you shall laugh. That is, there's going to be an environment of joy that actually produces laughter. And right now, it's the stress and strain of life that produces perpetual weeping. Some of you feel like that, like it's all I do. I mean, single-handedly, I'm keeping the Kleenex industry in business. Well, no more. You're not going to need tissues in heaven, partly because the the Lord says, I'm going to dry up every tear, but then he says, it's not just that tears cease, but you're going to be so full of joy that laughter is going to be an ordinary part of every single day. Oh, what promises these are, but finally, he, he promises great reward. And that comes on the heels of verse 22 and some really difficult, if not painful, things for us to experience when people hate us and exclude us and revile us and spurn our name as evil. Nobody likes to have their their reputation drug 
uh, through the dirt in that particular way. But look at verse 23. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Why would you rejoice over all of that suffering? Well, here's why. Because it's an indication that God is preparing a great reward in heaven. And that implies a couple of different things. Not only that the reward itself is great, but that you're going to make it. And right now, some of you don't feel like you're going to make it, do you? Some of you actually are struggling at a very deep and personal level, maybe in a way that you haven't even been able to articulate to your closest friend, but you actually wonder, will I make it? And your faith feels so fragile. Your faith is so frayed. You're holding on for all your worth, just saying, God, where are you? Where's the relief? Where's the comfort? Where's the healing? Where's the hope? And he shows up in a passage like this and he speaks with all clarity. You are blessed and you will be blessed. Yes, there is a temporary cost, but there is an eternal blessing coming. Now, the next paragraph is challenging because in it, Jesus predicts great woe for those who ignore and reject him. That word woe uh, is actually related to a couple of different phrases that we typically uh, incorporate into our conversations in this day and age. But one of those expressions, because it's actually just an interjection. Uh, some of you even use the, the term oy ve or the shortened uh, version of that oy. Well, you know, you're actually speaking Yiddish to be specific, but that's a word, a term, an expression that goes all the way back to Bible times. It's not one for one identical, but it's really close. And we say things like that when we're like stunned and surprised or amazed, right? You know, part of Kristen's cancer treatment this past year has included these monthly injections. And she tells me that the needle they use is really big. Uh, at one of the particular appointments, a trainee accompanied the nurse who was giving the shot. And Kristen said that when the nurse opened the package and the trainee saw that the size uh, of the needle, he could not contain himself and spontaneously blurted out, oh my. And we, I mean, we've laughed about that since. We've wondered if, you know, there was a, a follow-up conversation that the nurse and the trainee had together about things you should and should not say when you're taking care of a patient. And you know, even in Kristen's case, because she, like so many of us, you know, she, it's, it's fairly routine now, but there's still a little bit of what we call the white coat syndrome. Are you familiar with that term? It just means when you gotta go see the doctor, your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate's accelerated, your palms are sweating, you're like, oh, I'd rather not be here. But you know, when a professional spontaneously says something like, oh my, that doesn't bring your heart rate or blood pressure down, right? But beloved, I want you to think in terms of the weight we should give to Jesus' words, who is the Lord and judge of all the earth, who says in reference to things that are coming for those who ignore him or reject him, whoa, there should be a greater weight in this. It's easy to dismiss it because at the moment it looks just like words on the page. But there's so much more here. And as people, as, as Jesus addresses these people gathered in this crowd, he speaks to some of them whose lives are not tracking on a line of faith. Now look at the text with me again because he says, first of all, woe to you who are rich. Verse 25, woe to you who are full now. Woe to you who laugh now. Verse 26, woe to you when all people speak well of you. What, what is this all about? Well, right in the middle of that, he actually says, you have received your consolation. So there's a clear contrast to the first group where he's recognizing there's a temporary cost, but now he says there's temporary consolation, temporary comfort. So that means whatever they are experiencing has a very brief lifespan and it has a very brief and, and rather shallow benefit. 
This is a group that, as one author notes, are about to face eternal loss. And the crowd Jesus is speaking to includes those whose material prosperity has warped their personal orientation to God. They live in a state of mind which, note these descriptors, ensnares the rich in the limited perspectives of this world, lulls them into a foolish self-confidence, and insinuates to them that their material prosperity has its goal simply in their own enjoyment of the good things of life. Can you hear an echo of Ecclesiastes? We sometimes misquote the Bible and say money is the root of all kinds of evil. Well, that's actually not what the Bible says. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The world is the Lord's. The fullness of it, the Bible tells us. He created all that is, and He created all that is good. That's the default mode of planet Earth. That's actually the default mode of your existence. It's a good thing to have life. It's a good thing to have possessions and uh, financial resources, a house, an apartment, a car. But we don't set our hearts on those things. And the real danger of living at a moment in history when I, I know there are some here of very intense financial burdens on them right now, but you know that we, our generation lives like in the top 1% of wealth and resources of of all generations who've lived in the course of history. I know some of you get tired of hearing your grandparent, your parents for that matter, but grandparents, even a great grandparent, talk about you know, how hard it used to be. And it really was. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for electricity and running water and hot water that comes out of the faucet. I mean, you know, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I pr should probably upgrade because I hate waiting 30 seconds for hot water to come from the heater all the way up to the, you know, the, the sink. This is not hard. And there's a danger when we enjoy the kind of lifestyle and resources that we have that we too would be ensnared by it and lulled into this foolish self-confidence that all is well. And Jesus very boldly and lovingly steps right into the middle of a culture that's wrestling with similar things in his own day and age. And he's saying to the rich, he's saying to those who are full, who laugh and who, who enjoy the, the admiration and accolades and approval of those around them, the woe. Woe, you, you do not know what's coming. And look at what he says is coming. This is what characterizes the eternal loss. You shall be hungry. You shall mourn. You shall weep. And did you notice that Jesus doesn't put a termination point on any of these things? He's not stepping fully in or into a discussion of of the full doctrine of eternal punishment, but he just pushed open the door. And while there is an eternal kingdom with all the blessings and benefits we just looked at for those who follow him, there's also an eternal uh, destination, a corresponding eternal destination and experience for those who ignore and reject Jesus. And my friend, he loves you enough to bring you here to this assembly this morning and to put this very text, the record of a sermon he preached 2,000 years ago, right in front of you so that you could hear it and consider, am I among those who is ensnared by the spirit of this age, who has been lulled into a foolish self-confidence, who will miss eternal life because I'm too in love with my stuff, my experiences, the sources of my laugh, temporary laughter and joy right now. Is that you? For there is a, a devastation and misery coming that even the expression, oy vey, cannot 
comprehend. There's a promise of blessing. And there is a prediction of woe. But I want you to see how Jesus returns then to his faithful followers and says, here's my plan. Jesus proclaims his plan for those who follow him. And how countercultural this is. Verse 27, I say to you who hear. And, and Luke had noted earlier, they came from everywhere to this level place. Verse 18 says, they came to hear him and to be healed. And, and we can be confident that he was healing them, but he's also speaking words that they need to hear. Now, there's a lot. I mean, the, the next handful of verses are so densely packed, we can't do them justice uh, in the remaining 15 minutes here. So I want to categorize them into three headings that I think will be memorable, easily remembered, I should say that. Not memorable because you're going to go, oh, wow. But just like, oh, yes, we recognize all those words. And the first category would be this. It's a call to love. And he begins by saying that. Love your enemies. But let's package a few other terms of command with that. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. What, what, what kind of strategy is this? That looks like weakness, doesn't it? We live in a day and age that says, no, let's rally enough people. We'll go cancel that dude. We'll cancel that crowd. We'll show them who has the buying power in our economy. Oh, that's just not even on Jesus' radar. And did you notice he's not saying love people who are nice to you? And he'll come back and reinforce this a little bit. No, he just says straight up, love your enemies. Really? Do I have to? They're enemies for a reason. They're mean, they're nasty, they write hateful stuff, they do really bad things. I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't we bring the hammer of justice down on them? Remember God said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. We leave that in his hands. And right now we actually love our enemies and we look for ways to do good to those who hate us. We bless those who curse. And we pray for those who mistreat us, who actually act spitefully toward us. Did you catch the line in the hymn we sang earlier? O church, arise. But the line that, that I love every time, I love that whole hymn, but I always love this. Our, our call to war is this, to love the captive soul but to rage against the captor. We gotta keep in mind who the real enemy is. Now it's hard when somebody is standing in front of you and saying hateful things and doing evil things to you, it's easy to think, well there's the enemy, it's really not. That's a soul that's under the power of darkness. That's a heart and mind that's been so deluded, even blinded by the God of this world that they're culpable, they're, they're, they're guilty even before God for what they're doing and saying, but they're not actually the enemy. They're captive. They're enslaved. And they need rescue. And that's where I love the, the truth of this hymn as it rolls on. With the sword, which is God's word, that makes the wounded whole. They're already wounded. We're not unsheathing a sword to, you know, further wound or kill them we're actually unsheathing the sword of God's word that makes the wounded whole and it's with that weapon that we fight with faith and valor oh, what a different kind of plan this is that brings us to the second part of it it's also a call to grace verse 29 um, in verse 29 we read Jesus saying, we offer the other cheek. That actually can be translated as jaw. It's a pretty severe blow. It's not a little, you know, love tap across your face. Give to everyone who begs from you, and as you wish others would do to you, do to them. Now, you see that quotation and I, uh, on the screen in front of you. This challenged my heart, and I think it will challenge you as well. And I want you to think about the fact that in our ethics, as we live out this plan of Christ, we are not to be determined by the prior behavior of others 
toward us, but by the character of God. No power in the world is comparable to agape love, both to keep Christians from becoming like their enemies and to release their enemies from the prisons of their own hatred. And you know, unleashing the love of Christ as we've experienced it and unleashing the grace of God as we also have experienced is a powerful, powerful strategy. We sometimes think of verse 31, if you look at that again, as the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I actually think that's deteriorated into a little bit of of a counter-gospel transactional thinking. Hey, if you want people to be nice to you, be nice to them. I don't think that's actually what Jesus is saying. I think it, it might be better termed or described as the grace rule, not the golden rule. For we are all actually guilty of great evil one against another and certainly against God. And yet he has treated us not with what we deserve to receive. And he sure didn't begin to treat us in a way where he'd say, see, I'm being nice to you. Would you stop being mean and evil and rebellious toward me and be nice to me? No, his grace came in through Christ and it began this mighty transformation. We didn't receive the condemnation and judgment that we deserved for our sin, but rather by grace, he changed us, remade us, and called us into relationship. And Jesus asked a series of questions. What benefit is it to you? What credit is it to you if you actually just treat people the the way you want to be treated or in a transactional kind of way. I think we need to wrestle with that. So as Jesus proclaims his plan, it's a call to love. It's a call to grace. And then he says in verse 35, your reward will be great. He incentivizes this for us. You think about the grace that you have received. My mind went back to Romans 5 in the, Uh, as we, it's hard to believe it's been almost three years since we were, three years ago that we were in this passage in Romans as we worked through that book. But if you read through these particular, these five verses, verses six through 10, and you begin to to look at those particular parts that uh, are underlined there in blue for you, you see that God was acting even while we were still weak, while we were still sinners while we were enemies. He didn't wait for you to clean up your act and and even bow before him in great humility and repentance and say, I'm such a dirtbag, you know, please have mercy. And then he said, well, because of that, I'm gonna send Jesus into the world and, and pay the debt of your sins. No, it's while we were miserable, in our weakness, in our sin, while we were enemies, that Christ died. If we spend our time waiting for others to kind of see life as we see it, to agree with us, and to even acknowledge that they've been evil, hateful, hurtful, in all of those things that Jesus mentioned earlier, if we wait for all of that before we speak of Christ and share the gospel, we'll never share it. It's a plan of grace. Finally, it's a plan of mercy. I want to direct your attention to two particular attributes, characteristics of God the Father that Jesus touches on. Do you see these in verses 35 and 36? After commanding us to love our enemies, to do good, to lend, expecting nothing in return. Yes, and this is marvelous. I'll have to leave this. You'll have to work it out on your own. You will be sons of the Most High. But notice this. Four, do all of this because he is kind. And who's he kind to? the ungrateful and the evil. That's the gospel. God didn't wait for you to have a heart of gratitude before he said, now be kind. God didn't wait for you to clean up your act and turn away from evil 
before he said, look at my kindness. And he calls us to follow in his path. He calls us to demonstrate to others what we ourselves have received from him. And then in verse 36, he just simply says, be merciful even as your father is merciful. That is, your, our hearts need to be full of pity and compassion for our enemies. Now that can be really challenging, but if you don't begin with a right perspective of sin itself and what it has done to wreck the human race, it's going to be really hard for you to begin to see your enemy as a victim. It's going to be hard to see that the one who's perpetrating such evil, hateful speech or actions against you really is a slave who needs to be delivered. You've got to back all the way up to Genesis 3 where sin first entered the world and remind yourself, oh, the consequences were horrific. And then you've got to step forward by faith to the foot of the cross and go, oh yeah, that's right. That's what was necessary for this world to have any hope. That's the only reason I'm in a very different place from this guy who's making my life so difficult right now. God, you've had mercy on me through this powerful cross. I'm begging you, have mercy on this associate who I want to call friend and brother one day, but who acts and operates like an enemy right now. God, work in me that you might work in him. I look at that and I say, that's humanly impossible, and that's exactly right. But spiritually, with God, all things are possible. Now, there's a beautiful picture right on the front side of this sermon of the Father's mercy. And if you go back and read through verses 17, 18, and 19 again, keeping Jesus' sermon in mind, it makes it all the more remarkable when Luke records that a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, I mean, the crowd that has gathered is from every social strata of life. They're from all kinds of religious backgrounds. There are ethnic divisions that no human negotiation has ever been able to overcome, even to this day, and I'm speaking chiefly of Jews and Gentiles, but they're all there and they share one thing in common. We want to hear what this man says and we want to be healed by this divine power that comes from him. And that gives you a little glimpse of the kingdom and that gives you a little glimpse into the heart of pity and compassion or the heart of mercy that God the Father operates with. What a plan. What a promise. It's an amazing gospel. You cannot earn it. God gives it freely. And he establishes his kingdom not through military strategies, not through political intrigue, not by controlling the world's monetary system or currencies but he begins to establish the dominion of the father in individual hearts changing people one at a time household here a household there a community a city a country and one day the world and his plan includes you. Are you among those who see it? Who believe in Jesus and say, I'm willing to, to pay the cost right now. It is painful, but oh, it's just so small in comparison to eternity. Or are you among those who like, no, I like my lifestyle. I would actually take my money over Jesus any day of the week. Oh, dear friend, there's a predicted woe. Do you not believe that? Will you forsake the really small, short-term comfort and consolation you're enjoying right now of your 
wealth and your experiences and even the laughter that comes out of you, will you say no to that in order that you may gain eternal blessing? Those are the choices that Jesus sets before us today. And he calls you to follow him. Would you bow your heads, please? If you say, I, I need to follow Jesus. I've never actively made that choice before, but today is a day I, I hear him. I feel like he has spoken so clearly to me. If you would like for me to just include you in a prayer of, of blessing this morning, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, could I invite you just to raise your hand that I might see it? I won't call you out. I promise I will not embarrass you, but you say, yes, pray for me, please. I really do want to follow Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Father, you see every heart. Thank you for these who are responding to you by faith right now. Would you strengthen and encourage them? Whatever they need to leave behind, turn away from, give them strength to do it, and give them joy and hope as they trust you that you are and will bless them even though there's short-term cost. Would you grow great faith in all of us until Jesus is truly all to us. Change us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. At the conclusion of the service, we actually have prayer teams that are available, and I'm gonna do something a little different right now. Uh, Matt's gonna come and just share a few important announcements regarding life uh, here at Gospel Hope, some things that are on the calendar. But after he dismisses us, um, there, are, there are a couple of members of the prayer team and I who are going to be right here at the front of the, the auditorium. And if you would like one of us to pray with you or if you have a question as a follow-up to the message, uh, it would be our great joy to talk with you. And you'd say, I don't have time now. I've got another commitment. Then let's find a time during the week. Uh, it would be our joy to just meet you uh, at your convenience. And we can talk, we can pray, we can go back to God's word. Uh, but we love to help uh, one another find those next steps, what God is calling us to do. I think our prayer team members, uh, Stacia, are you and Aaron on call? Okay, I don't want to embarrass you right now, but uh, if you start looking for the yellow lanyards, the yellow lanyards are prayer team people. So even if they're just wandering the hallway, like they're here to serve you, even if they're not officially you know, scheduled as, the, as uh, Aaron and Stacia are after the service today, but just let us serve you any way that we can, and uh, we would really count that as a great honor. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We hope you won't run off. Uh, Matt, would you please come and bring us up to speed on these important things that are just around the corner from us? God bless you. Thanks so much, as Danny said, for worshiping with us. I feel like that's one of those messages that all of us have something to take home, right? Maybe you need some encouragement from the first few words of Jesus. Maybe you need the warning, and that needs to sit on your soul. Or maybe you, uh, like me, need the challenge to live in love and grace and mercy uh, this week. So thanks, Danny, for that. If you are a guest with us, thanks for coming. We so appreciate that. Uh, if you could take a minute and just fill out the little Connect card there, uh, that would be a huge help to us. Uh, we will not uh, sign you up for anything you don't want to be signed up for. We'll send you a quick follow-up email to say thanks for coming, and then you can decide where you want to take it from there. Um, but you can either use the QR code or fill out uh, those four blanks. And if you drop them by the welcome table on the back, uh, we got a little gift for you as well. Ladies, don't forget your retreat is a couple weeks away, and this is the week to sign up. Uh, so make sure you click that register now link in the weekly email or on the uh, digital out the door handout or grab one of the half sheets with the QR code on it and register. It's $50. It includes a great uh, dinner and um, some learning time and activities Friday night and on Saturday morning and you will want to be a part of it. There is an option if you can only come to Friday or Saturday. Uh, there's kind of a half retreat option and would encourage you to jump in on as much as you can make that investment uh, in relationships and in your own walk with the Lord. 
And then don't forget, Easter week is not far away. It's just a couple weeks uh, from today. It's early this year, and we got a few things going on uh, that week. One is not Easter related, but each year we get a chance to go to a Salt Lake City Stars game. That's like the team right below the Jazz, and we actually have a couple in our church, and the husband plays for the Stars and also a little bit for the Jazz, and so they provide us with free tickets. We have a big time as a church family. Uh, it's a great uh, activity for your family, and so that's coming up on Tuesday, March 20th. 26th and then uh, no growth groups that week we have a good Friday service on the 29th and then Easter Sunday is uh, in March this year which is a little bit unusual it's usually an April holiday um, but it is on the early end and we don't want you uh, to miss that as you might have noticed we didn't take a physical offering today uh, we do believe in giving to God as part of our worship um, so whether you do that digitally or through the mail uh, or if you brought something to give awesome uh, there's an offering box in the entry out to the left just on the wall and it's labeled and you can uh, drop your offering there But with everything else going on we uh, decided not to pass plates today Well, let me say thanks for coming again And uh, we hope you have a good afternoon and some good time fellowshipping together as we wrap up our service. Have a great day Big yawns. Spring forward y'all